So in the last class we were discussing uh, settlement risk. Okay. So I gave you the example of Herstat Bank. Essentially, settlement risk is remember this concept that it, le it relates to the delivery of the assets. Okay. We already discussed a case where we discussed this. This is falling under the subtopic of here you see settlement risk. This is falling under the subtopic that uh, essentially here. Okay. You see all these different. These are not important at this stage until we come to study the uh, individual instrument types such as futures, forwards, etc., which we will do in the subsequent courses, swaps. But the point to remember at this stage is only this. The reason we are looking at these kinds of uh, uh, thing, value, so we have value cash, we have all these different types of uh, uh, instruments or contracts which are distinguished from each other by one of the main ways of distinguishing them from each other is by reference to the distance between the settlement date and the transaction date. In case of transactions value cash or value today, there is no distance. They are falling on the same day. So this is one useful way to distinguish between these types of instruments. So you see once again, I think we have to make this much smaller. One of the problems of Chrome is that if you, uh, you know, downsize one window, all the, I mean one tab, all the tabs, but Firefox doesn't make that mistake. Firefox is better, but then Chrome has other advantages. It's, it's faster. Okay, now everyone can see all the options, all the all the instruments, right? So one of the ways we distinguish between this is basically by looking at the transaction date versus settlement date. And in this as part of this subtopic, we have the question of so strictly speaking, there should be a column between uh, somebody pointed it out the other day uh, at the end of the previous class. So strictly speaking, there should be a column between cash and spot, and that column should be called Tom. Tom is for tomorrow. Okay. So in the if you go to a foreign exchange trading room and somebody says uh, SBI calling for Tom dollars. Okay. Tom dollars means he wants to buy or sell dollars. He wants to transact in dollars, but he wants to do it for value Tom. That's not a normal. Uh, that's not a normal uh, maturity for spot for foreign exchange transactions because normally foreign exchange transactions are value spot. Most of the transactions are value spot. So if SBI is calling for Tom dollars means that they want to get a price for dollars, okay? Which uh, they want a two-way price. We'll see what that is later. But they want to get a price for value tomorrow, okay? So the other thing, obviously, you have to remember is that the uh, the price uh, the price for each of these types of instruments will differ because the settlement dates will differ. Okay, so because of the time value of money, okay, and also sometimes the yield on a particular asset, obviously, uh, when you realize that money, okay, will make a difference to the pricing. Okay, so therefore, the price always differs based on the actual settlement date. So that's why they are calling for Tom dollars, means they specifically mentioned they have mentioned that we want it for value tomorrow, not value spot. Okay, so, uh, so strictly speaking, there should be a column here for Tom between cash and spot because cash is t plus 0 tom is t plus 1 and spot is t plus 2 okay usually t plus 2 so but i have not put that tom dollar call a uh, tom value tom column there because tom transactions are not very uh, common okay so that's why uh, i just put in cash to distinguish it from spot uh, to give you the idea that there is there is something before spot as well okay this is called anti spot so cash and tom are referred to as anti spot anti you remember and this anti is not a and T I. This anti is so we can write this here. Okay, these are called anti spot. If you look at an Italian restaurant, I was going to write antipasta. So the appetizers are called antipasta, which is anti is the Latin for before. Like that's why we have ex ante, ex post. Remember in lab you studied ex ante, ex post. So this anti is not a n t i, it's a n t e. Anti means before. So anti spot. Now why we don't? With the reason we have uh, uh, anti spot transactions. So these are called anti spot sometimes because uh, they. Are are before cash, uh, before spot. So spot is T plus 2 and cash and Tom are 
T plus 1 and T plus 0. So these are sometimes Cash and Tom are referred to as anti spot. Okay, later on when we do foreign exchange swaps, you'll see that there's a separate subcategory of anti spot swaps. Okay, where there's one leg which involves a cash or a Tom. So that's that's a term to be aware of, but I haven't put it because these are not common transactions. Okay, so under this we had so the, the entire discussion here, you can see all this stuff, of course. <coughs> But the point is essentially this, that when you look at a futures quote list, this is actually net on your forwards, this is oil futures, uh, so right. So at this stage, we are not going to get very, uh, you may feel that <clears throat> at this stage, uh, you don't really understand, like I think Pulkin was asking about, I don't know what futures are, I don't know what forwards are. That's okay, you're not expected to know what futures and forwards because we haven't discussed those instruments in detail. You just need to know that, okay, these are a type of instrument, okay, these are not an asset class, these are a type of instrument and they can be matched with any asset class in any market. And then you should also remember what we discussed earlier, that whenever you see a price for anything whenever you see a price for anything in any market uh, it will take a little time to load yeah, let's give it time to load um, right here here you can see they're giving it still for uh, spots okay now if I go go for these are actually now quoting on a spot basis these are spot foreign exchange prices which you've already seen before when I loaded the Oanda FX trade platform these prices are quoting on a spot basis okay uh, and then if you wanted to see euro uh, US dollar forwards against most of the currencies you would click on this tab okay and you can see forwards now you won't understand this at this stage but their point here to understand is that uh, forward prices are quoted for various maturities so here you can see one week one month three months six months one year so these are various maturities forwards and you have different prices for different maturities like I said whenever you trade uh, the maturity here means the same as a settlement date okay maturity is the same as a settlement date so every time uh, you change the settlement date the price will change as you can see here the same market if you freeze the market you freeze the row and freeze the market okay but you look at the euro the price for one week and one month three months they're all different okay that makes sense because of the time value of money whenever if you want to buy something and you get uh, you are going to pay up earlier it's just like if you want to buy something on EMI or you want to buy it by credit card because the retailer will get the money later he will charge you a little extra but if you pay cash you get a discount because cash is going straight into his pocket right now okay so I have to give it a little time to load So there's a lot of material here. The main thing you have to understand is, uh, in, in this this particular piece of software, once you guys are able to log in successfully, uh, this particular piece of software is actually one of the best trading software that I've ever seen, best piece of trading software I've ever seen in my 23 years in the industry. Uh, and so it's, it's got tremendous capabilities. You can explore it on your own. There's no damage you can do. The only thing you have to be careful is, you have three accounts. Your project trading account should be kept untouched until you actually start trading in your project, the real life trading, uh, the actual trading for your project. Right now we are in practice mode. So in your two practice accounts, you can do whatever you want. There's no damage you can do here, okay? So you can just click this, click that, just experiment, okay? And uh, try to figure out and try to learn about the capabilities of the software. There's a lot of stuff you can do here. So here you have, now some of the uh, capabilities may not be available uh, with respect to the NSE stocks, because this is actually right now the login that you have is only for the NSE. Uh, so some of the the analytical capabilities may not be available for NSE stocks because there seems to be a different treatment of NSE stocks. You have a different login. Like later on when you do your US equity option trading project, you will have a different login. This login will not work for that. Okay. 
so uh, so you might encounter that uh, problem that some of the capabilities don't work but you can always explore it first and see whether it actually works so this is an example of what i mean this by this missing the chatter of open pit trading that if you are missing the sound of all your bids and offers being shouted out you can try this out you have a etf benchmark of all this stuff you can try out okay there's a lot of other stuff here you can check this i'm not interested in this right now okay so what do i have here 1000 shares of tcs this is the same login from which i did your uh, i did the um, recording for you guys okay so uh, the way you test that uh, just to test that if you have uh, this i just add one more stock maruti okay and let's say i add make sure you don't click futures or options so you are tra uh, trading in stocks uh, here the stock means the cash market equities these are not cash markets these are derivative markets and i think i might have clicked something else by mistake yeah i must have clicked that uh, i clicked the futures I, I clicked the options by mistake so i go to stock here so remember what i talk, what i told you guys about cash markets and derivative markets we're just showing you that in an earlier uh, session we have discussed it okay that so that's why you have to be very careful finance is not a physics kind of subject where everything means the same uh, you know once you use a term it means the same in every context but here it's a very context specific uh, subject okay so cash cash in one sense is cash market in the video itself you've seen that that cash is, uh, when we talk about cash markets here we're talking about cash markets in contradistinction to i'm going to select it first let's get the maruti prices in okay this also i'm going to uh, you can also learn a lot from here all kinds of analyst activity what is this uh, so for you and you have news here you can learn about our earnings calendar all this stuff i'm going to shut it down because i don't need all this stuff this is that uh, chart that I had uh, loaded up for TCS that is also showing here um, right so I'm just going to quickly show you what you're going to do once you get a successful login okay and oh, since uh, Surbi has been able to log in I'm hoping that all you guys who if you use the right login the right password you should be able to log in so I'm just going to try and quickly do a trade so I want to do a market trade I want to just test it okay uh, this is what I do I do this and I just uh, transmit and I get this kind of message but I don't get any kind of message you notice that here it doesn't say anything about you get the total value of the trade okay uh, you get all this margin esti uh, estimates and all that but you don't get any message here uh, saying that your data is not live please don't trade in markets be aware that you're trading in a market without live data there's a risk involved in that you're not getting that so I'm not going into the elaborate testing against Google finance or against the Yahoo finance to see whether the feed is live which has been shown in the video okay uh, ideally you should do that also so once for your to get your own feel of things but by and large it looks to me like the feed should be live because otherwise it would have given me an error message so I just quickly transmit down to the sound because my Okay, so you see how long it takes. Uh, it takes how long it takes to fill. Just to buy 100 shares of Maruti, they have to do three, four transactions. Okay, this gives you an index of how illiquid the market is relative to, say, the U.S. markets. If you wanted to do a transaction of this value in the U.S. markets, it would be filled instantly because it's much deeper, much more liquid. If you see here, I've shown you guys here this thing. Now you see, but this, if you, if you, this is the average price. Okay. You can see the commissions you paid here. Uh, you can even compare this. Some of you have uh, accounts in SMC and all that. You can compare.
compare this to your SMC commission and let me know what how this compares okay and this is the real commission okay so everything in this platform is real except for the money and so the commission that you get when you trade a real life account with uh, IB you won't get different commissions you'll get the same commissions in India okay so here you can see the breakdown of this trade you can see how many trades had to be done to uh, complete your 100 share trade okay these are all the and this you see is your weighted average price and this gives you an idea of the okay the execution I click this just trades okay all right so this gives me an idea that this is okay at least this is live all right so let's see where we are so we are actually making money on our TCS trade I don't know where we bought it exactly but uh, the market is a little higher so okay so um, let's go back to uh, I hope you're following where we were okay we were discussing this okay now uh, so as I said at this point of time we will be started with settlement risk we are going a little bit backwards this whole business of so the whole topic that is being discussed is uh, this concept of transaction dates and settlement dates and that these two are not need not be the same okay and depending on how they I mean depending on the distance you have different types of instruments which differ on at least on this point okay so at this point you don't have to get a very detailed look at futures uh, very detailed understanding of futures or forwards or swaps okay you just have to know that okay there are different types of instruments with these kinds of names that's all you need to know at this stage because we haven't gone into the detail of detail of these transactions yet is that clear okay so to some extent in many areas you might feel that I don't know what uh, like uh, Aurora came with a question thing I don't know why you bought how did you decide to buy TCS not sell it okay so that's a very that question actually has a very long answer okay so we are not going into that at this point you can uh, essentially assume that I just tossed a coin and decided to buy but the more important thing is how I executed the buy order and how I set the stop the stop should be clear to you okay so just try and follow what is being uh, discussed uh, in the class at the at the, uh, at the current moment and if there's anything that you don't understand this will also put a lot of pressure on you guys to uh, be more attentive and ask questions like Yesh was asking the other day please explain it once again you can always do that okay so this will make everybody more engaged okay uh, so that uh, you have any doubt at any point of time you be aware of what is being discussed and as soon as uh, uh, as soon as you don't understand something as uh, immediately you should ask a question okay is that clear okay so um, So, so these are just broad like you look at the hopefully it's layout so when you look at futures prices this is what it looks like so you see all these different maturities I don't know if you can read on the last bench Monica, can you read you can't read the stuff on the last okay so anyway if you see it here you will see that yeah so these are crude oil futures prices now you can read all this stuff you can see that they are quoted for different maturities and you can see that the prices in general different you look at the last column which is actually the second column here the last price column you see that the price is generally different from each maturity so at this point all you need to know is that futures contracts are quoted like this for multiple maturities okay and uh, you can see the URL here so you can uh, and uh, and that price is generally different for every maturity because essentially of time value of money okay because the other guy when you buy it this uh, the seller is not going to realize his money if the settlement date is further out he will take a long time to realize his money okay so uh, so the, the there are some exceptions to that rule uh, but in general that time value of money is a big factor uh, in in uh, the pricing of uh, any kind of instrument uh, relative to its uh, settlement date so this is what you need to understand at this point of time that you have different types of instruments called futures forwards and they all have different maturities uh, and they are the price will differ for uh, each maturity okay all right so um, here we have uh, then we have the discussion about settlement risk so we've just gone back a little bit so I have this little red marker for we'll come back to this okay and then we are looking at this um, so the other thing to understand is that um, uh, this I've already mentioned before uh, but 
you we can look at it once again okay that is that whenever you're looking at a price any kind of market price it's always going to be the price of some instrument or the other like i showed you futures prices i showed you forward prices so you can't so price is something which cannot be seen a market price is always specific to some instrument or the other okay it's always going to be either a spot price or a futures price or a price value cash or a price value tom you can't have a concept of a market price which is disconnected from the type of instrument for which that price is going are you getting my point it is always going to be shown for some time of so whenever you see a market price so someone tells you that the market price of ibm is uh, whatever dollars okay then the first thing you have to asking him is ask him is what kind of instrument are you talking about are you talking about the spot price of ibm common shares are you talking about the options on ibm are you talking about futures prices what price are you talking about what kind of instrument <coughs> So you have to basically go through this entire list of instruments, and you should have um, Tom also in your list in between cash and spot. So you should go through all these ins all these uh, instruments and ask him which of these instruments are you talking about when you mention this price? Which instrument does it pertain to? Is this clear? Otherwise, the statement is not really complete. Okay. All right. So uh, this is what we mean at this stage. Uh, so we have uh, asset. classes so asset classes let's just look at um I think by this time you're already quite familiar with all this okay you have um so right so here you see um based on the asset classes is everyone familiar with the concept of asset class by now an asset class is just basically we have a grouping of markets which are similar okay a grouping of similar markets essentially so we say that these things like um, say you have the euro usd here the sterling usd here okay these are uh, something which asset class should we put them in we have the following asset classes we should put them in currencies okay when you see euro usd etc okay then if i show you stuff like uh, you know the uh, uh, the prices that you have here all these apple amazon alibaba disney okay these are all spot prices okay this is all dead here because the market is closed right now okay so and anyway you won't get uh, live data in this login for this kind of uh, instrument okay so these are all spot prices for uh, where where if we take all these markets okay where should we put the where should we put them in terms of asset class equities is that clear okay and then if we have other stuff like if i put in um if i try to put in other stuff like let's say um okay so if i put in this so this is the nymex copper futures let me look at uh, september okay so you see september copper okay is basically 2 dollars 71 cents per pound okay so where does this instrument go uh, this is obviously these are copper futures okay so this goes in commodities okay and specifically because i was plotting the price of remember price is always the price of some instrument or the other okay so it's either a spot instrument like these equities that we looked at these are all spot equities these were all spot equities so specifically they would have gone into this box intersection of spot and equities all right in this case now i am plotting copper futures okay uh, i can also plot plot one more if i plot west texas intermediate crude oil okay Now you can see when you enter CL, you get a whole bunch of options. You have to be clear about you are not interested in Colgate Palmolive uh, spot equities. You are interested in crude oil futures. Okay, and so you enter that. You get a whole bunch of options. We will choose once again September. So here I have copper and I have uh, crude oil. Okay, so both of these will go in commodities. Is that clear? 
asset class wise they will both go in commodities I shouldn't have prompted you but you guys have already answered for copper right so this goes in commodities okay and, and specifically both of these are futures prices so they go into this particular box here at the intersection of futures and equities uh, sorry futures and commodities correct good uh, so are you following that when you get that kind of instrument you can put it in this so that is the utility of this kind of a framework because it helps you to take any market price that you observe for any uh, any price of any instrument for any market uh, you can put it somewhere into this box is that clear so that is the utility of this framework yeah yeah give us the mic yeah is it working yeah 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 so how do you know that it is a future price of commodity how would you know well one of the ways you know is that when you enter it here okay see when you enter it here what do they actually see we if we try um, let's try and enter something else uh, where if i can try and remember any of the ticker so let's just try if we have uh, no, they don't have the LME Zinc futures. Let me. Um, yeah. See, the New York sugar trades in both London and New York. But uh, so when I I have to know the ticker. So this is something that comes from your contextual knowledge. So typically the way the logic works is it's a good question because it's a fundamental question. Okay. So first you have to know what you're looking for. So if you know that you're looking for sugar prices, okay. So you have to know that sugar trades. This is part of your contextual knowledge. As you research the sugar market, you will know that okay, there are markets can either it'll either be a futures contract or it'll be a forward contract or it will be an OTC market uh, instrument forwards in the OTC instrument so if you generally there's a lot of activity in the futures exchanges so as part of your contextual knowledge okay you need to know that futures trade uh, the major you need to know the names of the major futures exchanges so in this case you should have know, you should know that uh, the CME group is one of the major futures exchanges and they trade a lot of these uh, you know agricultural commodities okay so you will go to the CME group website okay that is how it will work you'll go to the CME group website and you will find out from them the, the agricultural futures contracts that they have okay and so the New York Board of Trade this is NY board is it This is one of the major futures exchanges in the world. We go to their website and we would find out if I'm interested in the sugar market. I would find out the, whether they have sugar futures, and you'll find that they do have sugar futures. We have to make this much smaller. All right, so here you can see. Um, agricultural products to go into food uh, so this is a very useful website and they have good information so as I told you don't go and navigate anywhere uh, on the web for information especially on technical subjects like finance so there's a lot of garbage out there people don't explain the concepts properly uh, so go to only certified websites which I'm directing you to so this is one of those websites this they have good information there's a lot of material here you can learn a lot from this website so you can go to the CME group website you would go to trading this is how we proceed with any major exchange okay so if you want to go to the uh, ice ice is another exchange ice is intercontinental exchange now they just call themselves ice okay so uh, if you go to agricultural product if you go under our product groups you go to agricultural and there you'll find uh, they will list all the products that they have and eventually I'm sure you'll find sugar there because uh, NY bot is part of the uh, CME group Here. So under you can see once again categories and subcategories. You can see how many. I don't know again if you can uh, read this stuff or not. Grains and oil seeds. Can you read? Okay. So under agricultural, you can see there are so many subcategories. Okay. Grains and oil seeds, livestock. Okay. 
okay so cattle and all you have futures contracts on cattle as well on pigs and all that on on pork bellies all that stuff is there this is again showing you how this is why i tell you guys to keep focusing on us markets and the us economy because by looking at that you get to see what a developed economy looks like here our regulators are so confused every time the prices of some agricultural commodity goes up uh, you know futures prices go up they stop trading in the uh, you know in that particular market uh, in that complex okay which is a totally stupid thing to do because what you're doing is you're disincentivizing the guys who bought lower down okay so so by when prices were falling okay so if let's like, say jira prices have gone up a lot and then the government comes in and stops the trading okay what happened here now i have to cut marks for rotation uh, and uh, shiva what is happening okay okay fine i'll give you the benefit of the doubt because we want to see full engagement in the class okay so what you ha- what is happening here is that why is this a stupid policy move because what is happening is suppose jira prices were dropping a lot or pepper prices let's say were dropping a lot okay and uh, it was hurt, hurting the people who were growing uh, those products okay people who grow pepper now i come in as a speculator and i decide okay i decide these prices have dropped a lot now they seem like a very good bargain pepper prices will not fall much further i come in and buy a whole chunk of pepper okay so that supports the price and then eventually it starts to go up but what does the government do let's say i bought it when the prices were uh, 15 rupees okay and whatever be the unit and then as soon as the price starts going up to 45 60 rupees then the government stops trading so what does the government does the government has capped my profit by buying the buying the contracts at a lower price when the price was dropping i took some risk because prices could have dropped a lot further are you following the logic so by coming in as a speculator i actually benefited the economy in some way because i prevented a further fall in prices by taking an opposite position but by doing that i also took some risk but if i take risk i should also get a good return so what the government is doing by doing these kind of stupid things like cap suspending trading as soon as the prices go up beyond a certain point so what the government is doing is now they are capping my profit if it goes about 50 rupees then they, they say it's too high now we have to stop trading because there is speculative activity so what have you done you have capped my profit so what will happen next time next time when the boy cries wolf what will happen when the prices are falling i will be a little more hesitant to go in because i know that the, as soon as it goes up a little bit the government will cap my profit so next time i'll wait a little bit longer i'll let it drop a little more right earlier i stepped in at 15 rupees this time i let it go to 5 rupees so what's happening then the growers are uh, getting hurt even more right so by interfering i mean you have to be a total moron to do, do these kind of thing but this is what happens in this country year in and year out okay and this is what tells this is why this country is not a first world country otherwise if we had followed the right policies there's no reason for us we should have been an economy bigger than japan today by today okay but because we the only reason we are behind is we have followed absolutely idiotic policies and we are continuing to do the same thing even now we are not opening up the markets we are not following free market policies and everywhere in india you will notice you will never find a single person in india who understands the value of speculation everywhere speculation in india is a dirty word but actually speculation has a value yes, the speculator adds liquidity to the market he provides the other side of the transaction imagine that if you have a pepper futures market and all the players are people who are growing pepper okay so what's going to happen now if or if you have an imbalance let's say there are growers of pepper also and there are buyers of pepper also but there's a little is imbalance because growers are more in, more interested in selling and buyers are not so interested in buying here's where the speculator comes in and provides a balance to the market because speculators you can assume kind of will be 50 50 some guys will be bullish some will be bearish okay so what half the guys will come in and they try to provide buying support because they are interested in buying right so that will help the growers because they'll get some price support are you following the logic okay so we've gone into a policy uh, discussion okay but uh, it's important for you guys to understand this because in india nobody understands the value of speculation even guys who come with like phd's from mit they sit as a chief economic advisor and then they come and say that speculation is bad you'll never hear an indian uh, policy maker saying the speculation is good they just don't get it okay which is why as i said this is why we are a backward country this is why we are not realizing our potential otherwise we should have been an economic superpower like 30 years ago 
But anyway, so as you can see, coming back to Parul's question, Parul has lost interest because we are discussing policy matters. Now, coming back to your question, how would you know? You would, this is how you would actually know. Okay, you would actually uh, know what you're looking for. You would know where to find it. Okay, this is part of your contextual knowledge of markets. You go there and you find out. Okay, now you go to where will where will I find sugar in this, guys? Under what category? Grains and oil seeds. Sugar is going to be under what? Grains and oil seeds. Sugar is a grain and oil seed. I'll find it under dairy. Then sauce. Sauce is sugar, cocoa, coffee. Okay. Cotton is also there. They are not listing the cocoa here. Uh, I don't know why they have not listed the cocoa here. Maybe it's on a different. Uh, it should be here. Maybe they've discontinued it. I don't know why. Because cocoa trades in London as well. Uh, and as far as I knew, it was trading in New York as well. But they've stopped it. I guess whatever we'll have to find out. So here you know. Now if you click on the sugar futures, okay, what will happen is we are deviating a bit from the basic structure. But it's a good question. How this does you how to navigate uh, markets how to find out about markets okay so all this stuff is learning for you guys so this contract is called number 11 sugar okay it's traded on the CME group the New York Board of Trade Division here when you go into contract specs so actually in a way what the, the question that power was asking is I think how did I know to type SB why did I type SB why not uh, you know uh, LM or whatever okay so the way you find out the, the way you know that is basically from here they would have given the symbol somewhere here ticker symbol would have been mentioned under uh, the contract specs where is the symbol here For some reason they were not given the sticker symbol here it should be available somewhere here but anyway so maybe that's an IB specific uh, ticker but anyway so from here if I I know that I have used SB here actually so I know when I type SB I get this option okay so I get the sugar futures option and then I've chosen futures right so that's how I know it's a futures price because I asked for the futures price and then it's giving me the futures price it should give me a pop-up of why is this pop up, pop up not coming? Okay. Anyway, so we are not going to waste more time on this, but essentially this is a, for some reason it, it might have frozen or something like that. I don't know why it's hanging off. I think it's hanging a little bit yeah see it has eventually come up so when I choose futures because remember futures trade for different maturities you saw that display on the crude oil futures page they trade for different maturities and so the moment you choose futures it'll, it'll, it was hanging actually it's taking a little time uh, so you can see here at the moment you choose futures it'll ask you another question okay uh, which futures contract do you want me to show you okay so then you can choose and in this case we'll choose the April 20th so now we know these are the sugar prices okay right so this is essentially how you how you know that this is a particular you you entered the trick basically because the logic is that you you know because this is the ticker that you enter you ask for the sugar price and how would you know the ticker you would know from this uh, contract specs page I'll tell you why it's not there I'll, I'll, maybe we, we see it in the quotes they shifted it to the quotes the ticker symbol should normally be there I don't know why they're not showing it here okay I don't know why they should the ticker symbol should be there so this is something that you would know from reading the exchange web page they will tell you what the ticker symbol is just like this CL I know that it's CL the ticker symbol for uh, so this is a part of your contextual knowledge you'll figure out okay all right so we have deviated quite a bit but hopefully it's still useful material okay so we had just come here so essentially now you understand what an asset class is we were just discussing this this is an asset class is just a grouping of markets that are similar okay let's close this 
this is just a grouping of markets which are similar and um, So market we have already discussed, so the, the framework is called asset classes, markets and instruments. So uh, asset class we have understood, market is we have already defined a market, a market is a venue for exchanging two assets. So whenever you hear the word market, so here I've tried to in the body of material that I'm sharing with you guys, uh, we, are, uh, just, uh, we are very consistent in the use of terms, okay. So once I've defined a market as a venue for exchanging two assets, every time I use the word market it has it always has the same meaning okay so you have that advantage okay of uh, it's being used established. okay so a market is a venue for exchanging two assets okay so the moment you change any of the assets it will change the market okay so if you for instance go to um, we are not going to spend time on that right now but if you change so for instance gold gold can gold trades mainly in terms of US dollars but you can also take a gold price in yen or you can also take a gold price in Indian rupees. So all of these would be treated as treated as different markets. So when you're talking about gold as an in Indian rupees, that's a different market because the two assets are gold and Indian rupees. That's a different market from the gold market in US dollars because the two assets there are different. One of the assets is different. Are you following what I'm saying? So this is what it says here that a value changing any of the assets changes the market. So in terms of our terminology, we will uh, use this concept that the moment you change the, any of the assets, so if you have gold, uh, if you have rates and connection lost, or rates and connection reestablished. Okay, so the moment you have gold, you have gold in, uh, in US dollars, that's one market. So the moment you start quoting gold in Japanese yen, that's not the same market. We no longer say it's a gold market. It's actually we should what we should be saying is that it's a gold market in, in Japanese yen because the terms asset has changed. Are you following? Okay, so this is how you would treat it as a different market. Okay, an instrument is a contract. We have already discussed the various types of instrument. Okay, so it is always for the same. It's always the market price for some particular type of instrument. Okay. Tom. Okay, some other types of instruments which are not shown in the framework is uh, value tom and a CFD which is a contract for difference. We are not going to go into this contract at this point. Okay, but you should just be aware that there are some other types of instruments which are not very common. Okay, and a CFD essentially is a retail instrument. In this particular finance set of finance electives, you are being trained for uh, working in an institutional setting. Okay, in a finance role. So therefore I'm not emphasizing or teaching you an instrument called CFD. You should know that there is such an instrument, okay, uh, CFD, uh, which is contract for difference. We are not going to go into the operation of that. It's just like a OTC market futures contract. Okay, that's how essentially it works. Okay, but it's a retail instrument. Nobody in the institutional market uh, uses CFDs unless they're trading with retail customers. Okay, so in an institutional to institutional a B2B setting, you guys are basically being trained to operate in a B2B setting mainly. Okay, so in a B2B setting, nobody uses CFDs. Okay, they use futures contracts or forward contracts. So, uh, but you should be aware that there are some other types of instruments like value talk contracts for difference and non-deliverable forwards NDFs okay uh, these are called NDFs this is an institutional instrument not very actively traded it's mainly for uh, currencies with capital controls like India China okay so you have a rupee NDF market in Singapore non-deliverable forwards very small portion of the overall market so basically if somebody tells you what are the types of instruments that you are aware of you would show the six instruments in that framework plus you would say that instruments that trade value top then you have a retail instrument retail uh, instrument called a CFD and then you also have non deliverable forwards okay but these are not very mainstream instruments these are not actively traded uh, uh, instruments okay but you should be aware that these instruments exist okay so in any market at this point what we want to do is you want to identify, identify the base asset the terms asset the unit of the base asset like whether gold is being traded uh, price is being quoted as per 10 grams 
our gold price is being quoted as per troy ounce okay all right so the unit so the unit is different from um we should write this here the question that uh, uh sakshi jain was asking the other day a unit of base asset i think you were asking or somebody else or maybe i think it was radhika who was asking this unit of base asset okay is different from uh, i'm not going to write perfect english here so it will be the concept but i'm just writing concept of market lot you know what a market lot is a market lot is in regular dealing there is a certain lot size okay like if you go to the gazipur wholesale market for vegetables maybe they are trading potatoes in terms of a quintal so you can go and ask them uh, give me a price for 1 kilo of potatoes okay so that means that the market lot there is 1 quintal okay so in every market setting they will derive they will evolve their own conventions this is a matter of convention they will evolve their own convention as to what the market lot is okay so which means that normally when you quote a price the price is uh, quoted uh, if you if i give you a slightly different uh, example the price may be quoted for quid per quintal but the unit the market lot might be 100 uh, might be 10 quintals which means that whatever the price i'm quoting you per quintal but this is understood as being valid for a uh, multiples of 10 quintals amount you can't trade that amount you can't take that price and say i want to trade three quintals are you following yes minimum you have to buy in multiples of 10 okay so let's put it this way let's put it another way okay say let's look at a real life example from here okay now here you look at these prices of facebook uh <coughs> facebook had a big big fine uh imposed on them recently okay so now let's look at prices of apple okay now so let's just take the bid side 20345 now this is the price per common stock for one common share of apple that 20345 is for one common share of apple but it is understood that when this price is being quoted to you this is for a transaction for multiples of 100 shares you can't expect to get this price if you want to trade in 37 shares so in this case the unit of base asset because i told you to distinguish between i told you whenever you look at any market identify base asset terms asset unit of base asset what instrument are we talking about okay and whether it's an otc market or an exchange traded market okay usually this comes from understanding the instrument like futures are exchange traded instruments forwards are otc instruments but some kinds of some types of instruments are available in both settings like options you can have uh, options uh, on currencies let's say you can have them in the otc market and you can also have them in the exchange traded markets so you have to also be clear about are we talking about an otc market or an exchange traded market okay this is basically to get the full value of this framework remember this framework it tells you all kinds of things it tells you what asset classes instruments and in between you have all the markets like i told you spot currencies here you imagine all the possible currency combinations like you remember your nc2 formula factorial n and all that permutation so actually what you have to do is you find out like how many countries exist and that's your end let's say 156 or whatever okay so that means here what you actually have in this inside this cell you have to imagine nc2 where n is equal to 156 so you have to imagine that all those that many pairs are being shown in the inside this box here inside i already went through this the previous day remember but i'm just rehashing it once again because it's an important concept to understand how this framework works uh, asset classes markets and instruments are the intersection of asset class and instrument you have the markets okay and inside this you have to imagine i'm just giving you the example for uh, currencies but for every other asset class instrument combination the concept is the same so technically if you have 156 currencies inside this box what you have to visualize is there are 156 uh, i mean nc2 
150 where n is equal to 156 that many pairs are being shown inside this box so euro usd comma usd jpy comma usd cad comma and so on and so forth are you following yes everybody follows what i'm saying here yes not convincing the nodding is not convincing or are you just tired okay yes Yush, have you followed what i said this is how you have to visualize it for every box yes no this is something again part of your contextual knowledge so as i said in, in finance like in pretty much any subject you have two types of knowledge you have contextual knowledge and you have conceptual uh, you know conceptual clarity so here part, and you need to have both so this is part of your trading us equities if you're going to be trading us equities uh, this is something that you'll uh, that you'll encounter in your research that the market lot in us equities is 100 shares yeah and the quoting convention is per share so this is what i mean by saying that be kept uh, when you're studying any market be clear about the unit of the base asset which in this case the example of common shares of apple the unit of the base asset is one common share okay but that is different from the concept of market lot market lot is decided by convention there's no conceptual element in this but what is market lot that is a concept that is that it is understood that this price this 203.45 price for you to sell okay is only available if you are dealing in multiples of 100 shares if you want to sell in you want to sell 23 shares you may not get this price okay that's called an odd lot okay so the opposite of market lot is odd lot okay so we've explained market lot we should also write opposite of market lot is odd lot and odd lot pricing obviously will not be as attractive as market lot pricing is this clear So, um, let's try and quickly, uh, oh, we have uh, 10 minutes, we have plenty of time. We can cover now our next concept, okay? Players in financial markets, okay? So, we have covered uh, essentially this part of this uh, thing. We will now quickly try to cover players in financial markets. What, what types of players do we have? We have uh, essentially you can see three types of players. So we have three high level categories and then we have a sub categorization within speculators. When you're looking at any market when you're studying any market okay, when you're studying any market from the, the perspective of understanding the uh, quoting conventions uh, understand i mean understanding the context okay these are the things you have to be aware of what is the base asset what is the terms asset what is the unit of the base asset like in india we quote the gold price as per 10 grams something different market lot again has to be thought of as a different concept now you clarify from the market concern what is the market lot like in india the quoting convention uh, the the unit of base asset for equities if you look at indian equities indian equities here okay where we have uh, i don't know where that went here okay so here i traded in 100 shares but i could have bought even one share yeah. so in india what is happening is uh, that the unit of base asset for which the price is being quoted is one share and the uh, market lot is also 
also one share but you should still understand those two concepts as separate concepts because this may not be the same in every market okay like in the US market you can see that the uh, unit of base asset is one share but the market lot is 100 shares so you should understand both so that's why when you're studying any market from a contextual familiarity point of view uh, you should identify these aspects okay so uh, okay uh, so we have three types of players and financial markets arbitrages hedges and speculators and you see how they are defined they are uh, essentially defined in a very simple way uh, in a, by looking at this common element okay with respect to how how they behave with respect to risk what they are trying to do with respect to risk once you understand the concept it will become very easy to understand okay so maybe first we should uh, okay we can start with orbit arbitrage okay these guys are not willing to take any risk okay and here when we are talking talk about risk we are actually talking about uh, market risk let me just clarify that maybe we should just collapse these a little bit it'll become easier to see them together okay and we'll collapse this also Directional speculators and market makers. All right, so we are going to say that this risk, the risk is referring to. You'll understand later there are very many very many categories of risk. So what we are talking about when we are talking about risk here, risk. little uh, asterisk applies to all uh, all these three categories okay same asterisk all right so when we are talking about risk here we're only talking about market risk there are many types of risk which we will uh, study later but for now all you need to understand is that there is uh, there are many categories of risk and there's one category of risk which is called market risk market risk is nothing essentially it's the risk that arises from market price fluctuations like here you can see that 1000 shares of tt tcs which i bought when making that video for you guys on that there is showing it's showing a profit of 23500 now it could have also been a loss okay so this is all the pnl that is happening uh, because of the fluctuations in the market price of the asset okay so i bought it and it happens to have gone up after that so therefore it's showing a profit if it had gone down it would have shown a loss this is what we mean by market risk the risk that arises from fluctuations in the market price okay there are other types of one example of another type of risk is credit risk like we talked talk about her stat risk settlement risk that's what we refer to as as a type of credit risk that the guy doesn't pay it's the same example that i gave you i go to a furniture shop i order the furniture the guy delivers and then i tell his uh, delivery guys okay you can go now i'm not going to pay okay so that's that's an example of credit risk then i took the stuff but i didn't pay right so that's just market so we can define we can understand these guys uh, the categories of players uh, from this very simple idea first we'll go into the detail later but first understand how it's organized neatly around this concept of risk arbitrages are looking to make riskless profit which means they want to do transactions in which uh, they are trying to make profits and they are not going to carry any market risk here if you see I'm making profits look at what I mean by this here actually I acted like a speculator I went and bought thousand shares on Friday or whatever day it was okay um, and now it could have gone against me it's happened so far that it's going going in my favor okay so I'm making money but I'm carrying some risk because it could have also gone against me the arbitrager doesn't want to carry any of this risk he wants to lock in uh, riskless profit okay we'll understand how this happens later but first understand the concept of arbitrage is a guy who doesn't want to take any market risk he wants to lock in a profit without taking any market risk the hedger is someone who is looking to decrease their risk okay so what 
what we say the definition of a hedger is this essentially this is how you should understand don't memorize it but uh, in a way you can understand the concept from this uh, we'll, we'll study in more detail later but the identified uh, the way to identify a hedger is a uh, uh, an entity whose first transaction will always reduce their total risk okay to some extent this definition will only become clear when we go into risk management and hedging later on but this is what we are talking, talking about and you look at the definition of speculator so you can see hedger and speculator are totally different because in the case of a hedger the first transaction decreases their total risk and in the case of a hedger in the case of a speculator the first transaction increases their total risk at this point don't worry about the total part so much but basically just focus on the risk because we haven't discussed what are the components of the total risk but this is how we are trying to define the three categories of players that you have hedgers speculators and you have arbitrages and they are defined with respect to uh, what they want to do to their risk okay uh, so these guys are always trying to reduce their risk and uh, speculators are trying to increase their total risk the first transaction at least will increase their risk and the arbitrages don't want to take any risk at all okay so we'll come at this point we are just going to uh, you know skip through this definition at this level itself and uh, try okay so we are out of time all right so this is your uh, stuff on the three types of players so the next topic that we have moved on to is essentially this three types of players in financial markets okay arbitrages hedgers and speculators okay and further we are dividing speculators into two types directional speculators and market makers so you have a high level category three high level categories and under speculators you have a sub further sub classification speculators are being divided into market makers and directional speculators this is clear okay anybody has any okay your class is dismissed so anybody who has any questions can ask me any technical questions and i want to close the recording no no class is dismissed so those who want to go can go but uh, normally some people have technical questions so if i'm answering a technical question i will make sure that it's recorded
Actually, there are many uh, platforms, but at the moment we go for smart. Okay, smart essentially means smart routing that interactive brokers is uh, itself going to do. But actually, in the US, although you're trading on the this stock is listed on the NYSE, but there are many venues for trading the stock. Like you have all kinds of ECNs and other markets within the US. All I mean, it is basically for the same. Uh, this is the short answer to your question. That when you the moment you enter GE, first you have to know that the ticker for GE is uh, GE. So like if you are looking at Alibaba, you have to know you can't write Ali. Yeah. Of course, if you write Ali, they may still help you with an order complete and all that. But you should know that the ticker for Alibaba is Baba. Okay. And uh, so therefore, the moment you enter Baba, it will give you an option. Do you want to trade? This is the NYSE. You see, there are many other options for GE. So you don't want to trade like Georgia government bonds. You are interested in Georgia government bonds. You are interested in General Electric stock, which is trading on the NYC, and you are choosing smart routing. So that's how you know that stock here. Stock means spot equities. Here, stock means spot equities. You can see futures and options are also other, other options, other alternatives given to you. But this is how you know that uh, this uh, GE is a NYSE listed stock, and uh, this is the US market. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Okay. So, Mitchell's questions never end. It's like rapid fire. The moment you answer one question, the next question comes. Okay, go ahead. No, I'm not trying to embarrass you. Go ahead. That's a good thing, actually, that you have so many questions. NYSE, so not necessarily. The NYSE may list bonds also. Okay. They call it the New York, New York Stock Exchange, but they may list bond, corporate bonds also. It's not necessary that they would only have stocks. But whenever you are whenever you are entering a ticker and asking for a price, that's when you basically get to know that this is the instrument that they are talking about. Right? Just clear. Yeah. What was any other question? Sure. Yeah. What is your question? Okay. One minute. Yeah. Uh, when no, it depends on. It, again, it depends on the market. Uh, it varies from market to market. It, there are certain types of contracts, like the financial contracts, like S and P 500 futures, uh, U.S. Treasury note futures, where they are fixed uh, into very set quarters. Like they would be March, June, September, December. Okay, in the financial contracts. Okay, but in the agricultural commodity contracts, you can't be sure about that kind of regularity. It depends on the harvesting seasons, okay, uh, planting season, those kinds of. So it really, the, in the case of agricultural contracts, you'll see that if you look at, say, crude oil futures or any other commodity contracts versus wheat, versus uh, sugar, cotton, you will see that there could be variation in the contract months, and those are all basically related to the selling cycle, the harvesting cycle. It is related to the dynamics of that particular commodity market. Okay, so you, essentially you will have to go market by market. If you are interested in trading wheat, you have to understand the dynamics of the wheat market. You have to know the specific uh, months for which wheat futures are traded. And they may not be the same as the months for cotton futures. So that is market to market. Basically it is driven by the dynamics of that market. 